Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on a delightfully animal-free morning. I haven't even seen a cat this morning. Uh, there have been a couple of birds up there chirping away, doing their thing, but you know, with few exceptions, you're not going to avoid that. But there have been nothing else. And again, the deers are history. Uh, apparently, they've been taken out like the goats. Maybe they're together somewhere in Deerville or Goatville or, you know, who the hell knows. They're frolicking in fields, having fun. Uh, they haven't been ground into sausages, which is actually what I think has actually happened. But um, either way, they're not around, and that's a good thing for me. I haven't even seen a rabbit, and that's fantastic. Uh, one thing that is not fantastic is the weather still sucks. Absolutely sucks. And it's like, in, you know, early October, at this stage, we should be getting cooler mornings and not humidity-filled, crappy, shitty mornings that, you know, still feel like I'm in July or August. It's completely unfair, and it does not bode well for the season that's coming. You know, I every year I hope for a freezing cold season, and virtually every year I'm disappointed. So it looks like this uh, uh, season is going to be no different. I'm going to be miserable and uh, not get these little freezing cold seasons snaps that I'm looking for and you know I see in the comment sections people saying oh it's cold and wet here and you know god am I jealous uh, one of these days I'm telling you I'm gonna get the hell out of here and I'm gonna go somewhere where it's nice and cold you know 360 five days out of the year the, like a radar tracking station in the North Atlantic the South Pole uh, Alaska. I don't know if it's cold there year round, but it's probably better than here for sure. So uh, anyway, one of these days that's going to happen, but uh, unfortunately not today. And uh, in the interest of time, in the interest of appeasing the people who may want a shorter video, including myself, honestly, I mean, I look at, I, you know, I think I do like a 20 minute video. I get into the editing uh, program and the thing's like 50 minutes. And oh God. What the hell happened? I, I mean, obviously, like some people say, I do have this tendency to just sort of ramble on. So we're going to try and, you know, cut that down a little bit. And uh, there, again, didn't uh, mute the phone. <sighs> Anyway, muted now. Um, so anyway, we're going to leap diving straight into this car. And this is a seminal moment because I've been promising this car for a long time. And it's finally here. And I know, I know in my heart of hearts that it's going to be a giant and terrific letdown uh, for a variety of reasons. But it doesn't matter because here it is. And I don't have to hear about me letting everybody down anymore. Uh, this is a 1981 Chrysler Cordoba, uh, known as the Doba by, I guess, the people who are fans of them, and God help them. Uh, I wouldn't put them much higher than the people who are fans of this particular channel, but God bless them. They're out there, and they exist, and uh, this is a car that they may like. I don't know. Maybe not. They may just be first-gen people, uh, but uh, either way, we'll get into it. Uh, the name actually first appeared in uh, 19, what was it, 1970 uh, as a trim package on the enormous Chrysler Newport. So it was the uh, Chrysler Newport Cordoba. And uh, it was, yeah, it had really Baroque themes. I mean, it was finished in Cordoba gold, as they called it. Uh, it had an antique gold interior and vinyl roof, an Aztec eagle hood ornament. And uh, driving it, it felt like Ponce de Leon on his way to the casino or Asian massage or a badminton tournament or something. I mean, it was obviously very Spanish themed, but uh, it only went on for one year and wasn't a very big deal. Uh, although I sure wouldn't like to get my hands on one now. Uh, the name Cordoba, of course, comes from a city in Spain. Uh, which is also a province in Spain. But the gold medallion on this car, and it does have a few of them because, again, it's the 70s. Well, this is the 80s, but uh, when it emerged, it was the 70s. Um, it was a, it was pulled from the uh, a coin that was robbed from the... Well, not robbed. That's not a good word to use in this day and age. Uh, a coin's design was bastardized from the uh, Argentinian province of Cordoba. 
and uh, those are the badges that appear on this car. So there's a little bit of confusion in my mind. Uh, that medallion was directly off the hairy chests of 70s dudes heading to the discotheque to try and hook up with, you know, ladies who looked like they could have been part of ABBA. And uh, I don't know why they didn't use like a Spanish galleon coin. Instead, they used one of these uh, Argentinian coins, but eh, they did what they did. So um, it was uh, obviously a Spanish theme, and that continued on through the years. This is a second generation Cordoba. It's based on the J platform. Uh, that was shared with the Dodge Murata if you remember that car, and nobody does. And also the Chrysler Imperial, which we did a review of not that, um, not that long ago. That also shared the smaller J platform. And uh, I'm gonna link to that in the, um, in the description section. It replaced the first generation Cordoba, uh, which were pretty big shoes to fill because that thing was an absolute hit. Uh, that was based on a larger, but still intermediate B body platform, uh, which it shared with a whole pile of Mopars, including the Charger, the Fury, the Monaco, Monaco and uh, Coronet and even the Chrysler 300 and uh, and some others. So the B-Body was pretty prolific. Uh, Mopar, by the way, it's a, a conflation, a, a molding, a merging of the words motor parts. Uh, and it first started getting bandied around in the 1920s in Chrysler service centers, but it didn't appear officially until 1937 on a can of antifreeze. Uh, and uh, it's been around ever since in an official sort of way. That took me like five years to look up. For like five years, I was wondering what the hell Mopar stood for, and I just never bothered to Google it. And then a few years ago, I did. So, you know, there's probably another 20 things that I keep meaning to Google and never do, but Mopar, I finally did. Um, the first Cordoba was a hit. It was an absolute giant hit in the blooming, blossoming, personally, uh, personally, personal luxury car market. That was, you know, you could almost say the personal luxury car market was as hot as the SUV market of today. I mean, it was enormous when it started coming out. Uh, it basically replaced the muscle car era, uh, which of course died in the early 1970s with all the insurance and fuel crunch and Ralph Nader shit that came out and sort of ruined it for everybody. So people moved over to personal luxury coupes, and uh, the Cordoba fit beautifully into that. Um, and the first Cordoba, it was supposed to be a Plymouth, but, you know, the at Times collaborated to make it a Chrysler. You know, the execs at Chrysler Corporation said, you know, look, we really don't have the personal luxury coupe sorted. We need one. Uh, you know, even though pr Chrysler prides itself on building only large cars, I mean, pridefully they only built large cars. Uh, they went against their grain and they decided to release the Cordoba as a Chrysler product uh, in 1975. And it worked for them. Although I will say, I think they just sort of you know, it's like short-term cashing in for long-term pain, and that's kind of what happened to the Cordoba. But when it came out in 75, bam! I mean, people really wanted it. They went absolutely nuts for it. And uh, the uh, supply couldn't even keep up with demand. Uh, they sold like 150,000 in 1975. Uh, by the time 1977 rolled around, that was up to 180,000. Uh, they had Ricardo Montalban pitching the car for them. Uh, you know, Kias Mos Macho, uh, Fernando Lamas, or Ricardo Montalban. But, um, yeah, but anyway, it really helped what was then a troubled company. I mean, they weren't making a ton of money. They were uh, going further in debt. And all of a sudden, this Cordoba came out and started selling like hotcakes. And it really helped them out. Uh, it directly competed with the old Cutlass, the Monte Carlo, and the Cougar. And uh, obviously, a whole you know, Grand Prix, a bunch of other personal luxury coupes. But those were its direct competitors. And uh, it just seemed to work extremely well for them. Uh, yeah, given the Spanish name, the macho theme, so they did hire Ricardo Montalban, and I mean, who could forget that? It's become sort of a pop culture thing, uh, with him hawking the car, railing about the Corinthian leather, if you remember that. Uh, which, um, you know, it was... It, 
you had Corinthian leather, and I mean, it, it, it evoked these images of like nomads in flowing robes uh, bringing uh, very fancy hides across deserts in ox carts until they got to the coast when they went on wooden ships that sailed across stormy seas all the way to... Um, uh, Windsor, Ontario, where they went into the Cordoba factory. I mean, that was all crap. It was actually designed by an ad agency. It came out with the name Corinthian Leather. It was the same crappy leather used in every other Chrysler product. And uh, it was made by the um, the Radel Leather Manufacturing Company in Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> Which is about far from, you know, posh, exotic leather as you can get. But uh, it worked. I mean, people went absolutely nuts for it. Everybody, oh my God, it's got the Corinthian leather. Uh, Monoban went on the Letterman show a few years later and, you know, was, was just absolutely grilled by Dave, who finally got it out of him that the thing meant absolutely nothing. It meant nothing. Uh, but uh, it was terrific advertising. And people who were driving Cordobas back then... Uh, people thought they were kind of well-to-do. I mean, obviously, it was sort of a middle-class, upper-middle-class car anyway in terms of positioning. Uh, but, man, if you had the Corinthian leather in that thing, you were, uh, you were one sleek and badass mofo. Uh, but in 1977, um, this was interesting. In 77, the thing was available in seven, no, sorry, 16 different colors, actually 18 different colors, six of which were shades of brown. <laughs> had 12 normal colors and then six brown colors. Uh, there was light chestnut, caramel tan, coffee sunfire, golden fawn, Inca gold, and Spanish gold. Oh, God, the 70s must have been absolutely fascinating. But um, that went on. This first gen, or sorry, I have a second gen here. So the first gen went on through 1979, uh, and it was redesigned in 78 because sales had started to lag off. You know, there was a lot of competitors that were, frankly, just better at that point. And uh, the redesign was supposed to boost the image and get the sales back up. Well, it didn't. It failed. Uh, people didn't like it. It looked like it got a little bit larger at a time when cars were getting smaller. Uh, they went to these stacked rectangular headlights, uh, which were kind of popular at the time, but, you know, in retrospect, they don't look as nice as the round headlamps that the earlier versions had. And uh, it just didn't work that well for them. So by the time 1980 rolled around, it needed a redesign. Uh, Chrysler was, um, you know, trying to pump up the sales again. And uh, this is it. So this was the second gen, came out in 1980, had a sister car in the Dodge Mercedes, Murata. Uh, for 80 and 81, there was an LS model, <clears throat> which was the luxury sport, and it had this weird sort of cabriolet top, if you wanted it, and uh, had a uh, peppy, actually it had the same engine choices as this one, but we'll get into that. Uh, it was originally going to be batched as the 300, which was an historical Chrysler name, but they did away with that and made it the LS instead, for whatever reason, and uh, it was... Um, you know, I think they did a nice job of designing it. It was supposed to go to a younger and more sophisticated looking crowd than, you know, some of the bigger stuff. Uh, I thought it had nice sharp creases, good lines. You know, I think they did a really nice job, and the public did not respond to it at all. I mean, sales pumped up a little bit in 1980, as it does when you pump up any new model. Uh, but they instantly declined. And uh, in 81, when this car was made, they only made 20,000 of them. And I mean, compare that to the, you know, 160,000 or so in the second year of the first-gen production. 20 grand is pretty low. And uh, by the time the uh, third-gen... <sighs> By the time it wrapped up in 83, uh, only like 12,000 people bought one of these things. So there just weren't many out of them, you know, many of them going. Uh, it was unceremoniously replaced by the Chrysler Laser, uh, if you remember that thing. That was a front drive car based on the uh, K car platform in 1984. And uh, Chrysler just left the Cordobas to die on the vine. Uh, they were considered old Chrysler. Lee Iacocca had taken over the company. The K car had come out in 1981 and was selling like hotcakes and Chrysler decided that it was going to be focused in on the front wheel drive stuff, the modern stuff, turbocharged four cylinders, that sort of thing and uh, instead of revamping the Cordoba 
they just let it die. You know, like the Thunderbird got revamped and it did quite well, and so did the Monte Carlo and, you know, some of the other competitors. They went on to do great things, not the Cordoba. This was the end of it. <laughs> Chrysler just let it go away, and uh, I think that's a shame. I, you know, obviously, uh, when I look at this car today and I compare it to a K car, I would much, much rather have this thing. So, rear drive, you know, proper uh, engine choices up front, and so on and so forth. So. All right, well, look, anyway, I got one quick thing. They did run some of these in NASCAR. Uh, Buddy here, and I mentioned that when I did that um, Imperial video that I'm going to link at this. From uh, about 82 to 84, Buddy Arrington drove the J platform as a NASCAR. And he did you know, with Murata's, with uh, Cordoba's, and with even some Imperials, which were hilarious that they ran in that thing. Uh, but apparently they were kind of shit. They weren't great aerodynamically. And uh, none of the cars ever did better than 13th. So uh, poor Buddy, you know, he probably moved on to bigger and better things uh, when, when time progressed. So I'm going to pause there for a minute before I get into this specific car. And again, in the interest of keeping the video a little bit shorter after that 50 minutes sucker on the Mark V the other day, and uh, I'm going to dry myself off because even though it's October, it's still humid and hot as balls and miserable, so uh, anyway, there it is. I'll get my shit together, and then we're going to keep going. All right, so let's do a quick jam around this car, and uh, then I'll get my crap inside, and we'll go for a spin, and this video will be like 30 minutes tops, tops. Anyway, you see the very nice look. It, it, the second gen, this one, the first gen was absolutely epic. I mean, if you remember, Herb Tarlick drove one. You've got Ricardo Montalban selling them. I mean, everybody really liked the Cordoba, and it fit beautifully in with the personal luxury coupe setup. Uh, that was starting to wane by the time the second generation came along, uh, even though it retained much of the stuff that uh, personal luxury coupe should have. Uh, if you remember the Mark V we did the other day, that was sort of, to me the peak of the whole personal luxury coupe thing. Uh, that was retired in 79. So uh, this thing's coming out in 80 in the middle of all the downsizing and even the sort of entry into the people wanting European stuff. I mean, if you remember in that movie uh, Vacation, which I think was around 1980 or so, uh, he went to get the Euro Sport Wagon at the dealership before he ended up with the family truckster. You know, the people were moving towards a different breed of car uh, than the big dinosaurs of the past. And this was a smaller version of the big dinosaur, and there was nothing particularly special about it, uh, which is probably why it essentially failed and has now been forgotten. I mean, when I saw this thing, I was reminded that it even existed, so uh, that's just the way that it went. Um, the styling of the car, I think, is quite nice. I mean, it's very angular. It's got those slab-sided front fenders that I like. Uh, I love the turbine-looking hubcaps it has that sort of remind me of those Mark V alloys. Uh, it's got chrome around the windshield. It's got chrome mirrors. Uh, this one's two-tone. It's European taxi beige with uh, government worker beige beneath. So it's, you know, very posh looking as such. Uh, although it's not particularly highly optioned, this car. And I know I'm going to get shit for it, but uh, the hell with it. Uh, they had very nice setups around the, uh, the side windows, again, with more chrome. Uh, nice looking door handles on there. Love the cord Doba badging with the script and that uh, medallion from the hairy chests and the discotheques. Uh, you've got a rocker panel chrome strip or uh, at least a stainless looking strip, which looks nice. You've got white walls. Uh, you could get opera windows in, at least in 1980. Maybe they did away with it in 81. I don't remember. Uh, where uh, you see this has the vinyl quarter top with a big filled inside of it. And some of the earlier versions, or at least maybe an upmarket version, I noticed you could get opera windows in those, but they're not in this one. Uh, instead, you get those rear windows in the back, which are fixed in position and don't go down. And uh, of course, you know, Chrysler was in financial trouble at the time, so they're not really on the cutting edge. Uh, but running around the car, you've got more chrome trim everywhere. I do think the quarter top looks quite nice. You could get a cabriolet roof on the LS version 
version, which did a pretty good job of simulating a convertible top. You know, people owners could say, look, if you think it looks ugly now, wait till you see it with the top down, uh, which, uh, of course, would never happen. Uh, I do like the body color impact strips in the chrome bumpers. I think that actually is kind of a cool feature, even with those little silly looking bumperettes. Uh, you got big giant taillights for whatever reason uh, with uh, vertical slats in them in body color, reverse lights around the uh, uh, license plate, pinstripes everywhere. Uh, one of the issues with these cars are the body fillers, these things right here. And they are extremely hard. I mean, they're all, the ones that came out on it were all rubber and they disintegrated overnight. And uh, there's only one company now making these things and they make them in fiberglass, which is a miserable product to work with. And that was one of the things that held this car up uh, was the original fitment of those panels was so atrocious, I couldn't even look at the car. Couldn't even look at it. Finally, we got an Eastern European mechanic, a uh, very nice guy, and, uh, well, he's not actually. He's a horrible, terrible person, but uh, he does have that Eastern European pluck. I mean, these guys can make carburetors out of a bunch of wood scraps. I mean, they're unbelievable. And he refit all of these panels. And, I mean, even though, I mean, like, you look at it now, and it looks a little bit screwy with this thing bumping up and whatnot. Uh, if you had seen it before... <laughs> You would have been absolutely horrified. He did a tremendous job fitting them. And uh, they hadn't been painted, so I had to bribe our painter, Jeff. Uh, by the way, the vendors at Auto House, I tell you what, you have never seen richer guys. None of us make any real money but the vendors. Oh, my God. The guy who does the wheels, uh, Sean, he works like 20 hours a week and makes six figures. Jeff, who paints the bumpers, he has a fucking seaplane he just bought. I mean, uh, it's Sean, the wheel guy, has a new 911 Targa. Uh, so if you have any wonder where the money at Auto House goes, look no further than the vendors. And, of course, Peter, who's probably still having a nice beauty rest as I'm out here in his driveway filming. Uh, but, of course, he sold out, and, you know, here I am. But, uh, but anyway, through the Eastern European mechanic, who I won't name, and <laughs> through the vendors, who I will name, uh, and Chad, the other one... Uh, what the hell is his name? Ben. He replaced a guy named Todd who went off to become a prepper somewhere. Uh, ben just bought one of these uh, backdraft Cobras. I mean, I, I just... I'm telling you, this is what I need to do for a living instead of whatever the hell I am doing because it ain't working for me. Uh, and now I don't even remember where I am. Uh, the body fillers. So anyway, now they're fit a little bit nicer. They look pretty good. I did the pinstriping myself. I did a shitty job of matching the pinstripe, but the hell with it. It's done and I'm not going to change it now. And uh, honestly, this car, which was always nice, uh, frankly, for what it is, I think it came together really, really good. Uh, the, so the front cap looks good with the square uh, surrounds over the square headlights. You've got a waterfall grill. Uh, you've got a nice big chrome grill. Uh, again, the uh, the 300 or the LS version had a um, uh, one of these sort of plastic rubbery front bumpers, not unlike the Firebirds of the time. And I think it looked good, but it's not as elegant as this. And uh, this also does, of course, have the body color strip again in the bumper uh, with the little bumperettes. Uh, the hood has all sorts of nice styling and uh, lines in it. You know, there's a nice body line down the side. Uh, I just think it's a much more handsome car than it gets credit for. And uh, even though it failed at the time, basically, I think it looks good. I really do. You, I mean, you know, look, you can argue with, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I think it's a pretty good looking car and it's rear wheel drive and it's kind of fun to look at. So uh, I tell you, what, all right, let's get inside the trunk. I'm just going to start and get right into this. This is such a unmolested piece, too. It really is. I've got four sets of original keys for it with the, uh, well, maybe we don't. Yeah, we do. Four original keys, or two sets anyway. Uh, somebody instructed me on Chrysler keys. I said they were upside down, uh, which obviously shows that I'm a GM guy. Uh, but in fact, I have to admit it's pretty clever. They said by being in this direction with the uh, cut edges up, uh, the tumblers don't get a bunch of crap in them and they stay clean. So... Yeah, kudos to Chrysler on that one. So you have this nice big trunk. One thing I don't love about it is it's got, you know, the taillights up here. So you've got this big overhang. So if you have to lift crap up and put it in there, uh, you've got um, you got a pretty big way before you get it over the trunk. Uh, this one came with these two 
uh, big service manuals, which is nice. The, you're going to need this as you start repairing the car, but it's got all the crap in it for the whole car. Uh, you've got a 1981 North Carolina tag, which I think somebody sort of spiked me on because the car was actually sold in Pennsylvania in 1981. So I think someone just had this laying around to pretend it was a North Carolina car, but eh, what the hell, I'm going to leave it in there. And uh, then you've got this terrific uh, 81 Cordoba. Jeez, um, oh, I thought I put this thing on mute and it's banging away like crazy. <sighs> Anyway, um, so here it is. Here's uh, the Cordoba brochure. You've got, um, you know, all the different... There's that nose I was talking about with the LS model. Uh, there's uh, something that looks like the Bill Blass uh, Mark 7. And uh, here are all the different packages and radios and other shit you could get in the car. So that's kind of cool, and it's nice to see it with it. I also do like the black carpet, which looks nice in here. You've got a full-size spare tire. And uh, otherwise, you know, pretty nice trunk, I have to say. In many ways, it's certainly as nice as that Mark V we had. And the quarter top. I don't know, I just, I, I kind of really like this car. <laughs> Hey, to admit it, uh, with the Imperial, it shared the dashboards. You've got these weird modular looking, it's actually a whole modular dash, but uh, so what's this? The brake release is here. This is the hood release. What a big giant hood release. And over on the other side, you have the world's most overcomplicated uh, rear window defrost thing. But um, anyway, let's get in here. And here's where I'm going to get even more shit. I know the car doesn't have Corinthian leather, but this might even be worse. Okay, so here it is. Yes, it's got the 225 slant six engine. And we'll get, okay, first of all, I'm gonna throw this out. The 225 slant six is a terrific engine, or at least it was in many incarnations. In fact, I don't think there's ever been a bad inline six cylinder engine in any car. Pretty much, I mean, whether you're talking about Datsun or Chrysler or Jeep or AMC, uh, Mercedes, BMW, the inline sixes are just fantastic engines. And only because everybody's gone to these sort of cab forward things to increase the interior space uh, have the sixes, the inline six has gone away. Uh, you know, you might as well have a 12 cylinder because you've got two of them together, you got a 12, but uh, it's a long engine and that's the only reason they've lost favor. Mechanically, they're fantastic. They run forever, they're pretty reliable. And uh, the slant six, particularly in this version, is terrific. However, uh, in 1980, you could, there, uh, 80 only, there were three engine options. 81 on, there were two. Uh, in 1980, you could get this. This was the standard engine, the 225 slant six. I'm going to quietly mention that it was rated at 85 horsepower with 120 pound feet of torque. I mean, I think my dad's Isuzu iMark diesel had a higher horsepower rating, but anyway, we'll get into that. Uh, they had a 120 horse, you want to talk about seriously day tuned, uh, 318 V8. Uh, that option cost $64, okay, uh, which is like $200 in today dollars. I mean, it's it's nothing. $64. How cheap did the guy who ordered this car have to be to not spend the $64 to get a V8? I mean, this guy was cheaper than even my dad. I mean, holy shit. $64, you could have had a 318 uh, with another 35 horsepower. And then, yeah, yeah, Slant 6 is good enough enough for me. It's a good motor. So anyway, you just absolutely have to love it. And I want to say it's like the A904, if I remember right, uh, sort of a good old bulletproof three-speed automatic that any of the engines were mated to. There was also a 360 V8 that you could order uh, in, uh, in 1980. Uh, it had 185 horsepower. I don't know what it cost, but less than 100 people or dealers ordered them. Less than 100 ordered them. So, I mean, you talk about have one of those, you got a unicorn. Uh, and uh, due to lack of demand, Chrysler did away with that motor for 81, and you could only get the uh, 318, as honestly most people probably got, uh, or this uh, standard Slant 6. 
Uh, you can see under the hood, this thing is a 42,000 mile car. Very, very original, very lovely. All the right stickers are on there, uh, all the right markings, all the right plaques. Uh, I really have to admit to being a little bit enamored with this thing. Um, there's just something very honest about this car, and uh, I've enjoyed driving it yeah, as much as just about any other old car. Honestly, probably even more than some of the Cutlasses and... and um, uh, the Monte Carlo we had. This thing's just kind of fun to drive and nobody knows what the hell it is. But uh, the Slant 6 engine, you can see it's 30 degrees off kilter from being straight up and down. Uh, it's an engine that dates to like 1959. God, that bird is going pissed, pissed up right there. Right there. There's two of them. Staring. Get out of here. Go on. You know, they have the height advantage and they know it. They're not scared of me. The minute I turn around, those things could swoop down and start pecking into me. Anyway, um, now I don't remember the hell I was. Anyway, since 1959, Chrysler had been building versions of this engine. You could have them with aluminum blocks or iron blocks. I believe this one is iron. And the thing is bulletproof. I mean, even 85 freaking horsepower, which is pathetic. Uh, one barrel carburetor. Uh, but it is simple. It's easy to maintain. And um, it's just a damn good old engine. And, of course, this one is air-conditioned. It's been converted, it looks like. And uh, the air I can report is pretty good on it. So uh, there it is. And uh, we're just going to keep going. So I tell you what, I'm going to get my crap in the back now at this stage. What is that? We have moths. I do not like moths. Uh, I'm going to get my crap in the back and um, then we're going to hop in. I'll show you the interior and we'll go for a spin. Look at this shit. Right overhead. Right overhead. Now look, they're all staging in that tree right there waiting for me to not keep an eye out for them and uh, then when oh, the minute I look away they're gonna swoop down and start pecking at my parts that look soft and fragile Little bastards uh, they seem to be going away thank God anyway let's just get into this thing so look as I learned you know, I've gotten into that. I've always been around cars, obviously, and I'm pretty good at looking at a car. And uh, frankly, that's something that served me well over the years. Uh, but only recently, only in the last three to four years, have I started sort of zeroing in on this sort of collector car stuff. Uh, because I just find it a lot more fun than the cars that I'd been doing before. I've really enjoyed it, and uh, it's great fun. Uh, as I've done it, though, I've learned that... There is a wide variation in the stuff that comes up for sale in the auctions. You know, when you talk about Meekum or Barrett Jackson or any of the other collector car auctions, there's a whole uh, pile of cars that come through there. And I really feel sorry for your average consumer who's not a car guy who decides he wants a collector car. He trusts the name of the auction. So he goes there and starts buying things. And it would be really easy to get stuck with something that's a polished turd. Piece of cake. I've been stuck with a few of them myself. And, you know, I've to spend gobs of money to make them, you know, decent enough to put out on the market. Uh, so it's it's been a learning curve. This one, I am happy to say, this particular Cordoba is what I would consider a truly honest, wonderful old car. And, uh, you know, obviously there's some people, it's a 81 Cordoba, it's desired by exactly nobody. Yeah, that's fine. But, you know, it's still friggin' what? 40 years old, uh, you know, it has a true 40,000 miles, which I've determined. They don't all, you know, people roll back miles. There's all kinds of shenanigans that go on. Uh, it has original paint for the most part, which, again, is a little bit of a rarity because 40 years of paint, you know, if the thing's outside even a quarter of its life, it's been out in the sun for 10 years. So uh, you see a lot of repaints. Very, very few. I would call this in the top 10% of preserved cars, and it's a joy to me when I get one. Uh, it just absolutely is. And this Cordoba, honestly, despite its anemic six-cylinder and, uh, you know, whatever else it's lacking in terms of panache, uh, this is a car that I would own personally. I would love to play. If I had a big building like Peter or some other wealthy guy, I would have a bunch of uh, cars inside of it. 
as it is, I don't have that. So anything I buy is going to be kept outside or in a carport or under a cover, which means I just don't own stuff personally. It's good for me in a way because I don't have to collect things and uh, I can just know that I can't keep, I can't be a good steward for them. Otherwise, I'd end up with all these orphans. So it uh, it's actually worked out to my favor. Uh, but if I did, I would have no trouble throwing a car like this in there. It's cheap, you know, for a car of its age and its miles, it's cheap. And uh, it can only go up in value. It really can't become worth any less. And uh, it's just a true, honest car that's kind of fun to drive. And when you're on the streets, nobody knows what the hell it is. So um, anyway, it's just sort of fascinating to get into this world of collector cars. Uh, let's get right into the inside of this thing. Okay, so here's where I'm going to get shit. I mean, finally, I, I don't look at this stupid emergency brake thing falling off this pad. This is the kind of stuff that just... Anyway, we'll get that back on later. This is where I'm going to get some shit, because I finally get a Cordoba. A, it's not a first gen, which are the ones that people really like. And B, it doesn't have Corinthian leathers. <laughs> Oh, Ricardo Montalban, uh, you know, or the Khan or whatever the hell he was in the Star Trek movies would be very disappointed uh, that this thing has velour, which is actually nice. Maybe it's even just cloth. I don't know. It looks velour-y to me. Uh, but there's the tag for the keys. I'm telling you. Uh, but uh, so anyway, there it is. So it's got a six cylinder. It's got friggin window cranks, which actually I'm going to put down. Before we go for a drive, although the thing does have air conditioning, so I won't put the passenger one. And the AC actually works, which is shocking. Uh, but uh, anyway, so there it is, velour and an inline six cylinder, and uh, you know, it doesn't even have an eight track, but what the hell are you gonna do? You get the ones that you get. Um, the door panel treatment, I think, is actually quite nice. You've got the standard little rear ashtray thing. I like the way it works. Doesn't look, it's been used, but it hasn't been used that much, uh, which uh, means that uh, it wasn't really used as a Cordoba. And now I've got um, no more time on the video, so i got to delete a couple of videos to keep going. Hold on a minute. Oh, well, I'm glad I saw that red time thing flashing, or I'd have been doing a damn... I'd been talking into the video for five minutes while it wasn't recording. Hopefully it did record up to this point. I'm not even sure that it did, but I'm going to go with it and hope it did. Uh, but anyway, the door panel treatment is nice. Again, you've got acres of fake wood, as was common at the time. Uh, here's that hilarious medallion, which uh, you could just picture on the hairy chest uh, in the uh, dancing suit with the gold uh, chain around it. Uh, and apparently that's some sort of Argentinian thing, not a Spanish thing for whatever reason. Uh, here's a remote mirror and here's your window crank. Uh, back seats, your Canadians, you know what? They're going to be just fine. Uh, you got all this plush padding. You've got room for three. Uh, you've got a decent package shelf up there to stick an infant or toddler in. Uh, you've got decent leg room, more than that stupid Hyundai for Andrew we did the other day. And uh, otherwise, everything looking nice and tight back there. Uh, you can even see where it might have had an opera window. Uh, that's been filled in on the inside panel. That's hilarious. Uh, that would have been cool if it did have one, but eh, not with this package, apparently. Maybe this was a rental for Hertz or something. OJ was jumping over counters to get to it uh, on the way to the knife store. Uh, front seats, you've got sort of a split... You know, it doesn't really look like a split bench. I mean, it is 60-40, but you've got all this padding on the bottom seat. Um, I'm sure it's three across. I'm sure you can fit uh, a Canadian in the middle of that thing, but he's going to have to have an ass that's like three inches wide if he's not going to be having one cheek elevated on each side of the padding. So, um, But anyway, this these personal luxury coupes, again, were the SUVs of their time. So this was a six-passenger car, uh, essentially, which uh, we just don't really have anymore. Uh, thank God it does have a tilt steering wheel. It's got um, what I'm sure was the base uh, steering wheel with the uh, wood grain inlay, which is all in very nice shape. Uh, it does have, I tell you what, let's just hop in the thing and fire it up and see what we got. And I guess every Cordoba came with gauges of some sort. So we've got our Chrysler key here, which we put in what I consider upside down. But apparently is a, uh, it doesn't immediately go in easy, apparently is a uh, good thing. <laughs> There's that inline 225 
slant six fires right to life. So you've got this big giant dashboard on this thing that angles up and towards you. Uh, some people didn't like that, but I do. I think it looks pretty cool. Uh, also, I do like all the different gauge pods. You have a true temperature gauge. You have a true voltmeter over here. And um, well, I guess that's it. Otherwise, you've got an oil pressure idiot light. This is going to warn you if your belts are on. You've got high beams. Yeah, that seems to work. Um, there you see just 42,000 miles on the clock, 85 mile an hour speedo with 55 circled because of course that was the law at the time. Uh, over here this giant gauge which could have been a tack if it had an option is just a fuel gauge with your PRNDL indicator. Uh, here's your tilt wheel which has, yeah, works good. Uh, you got your cruise control and wiper stock here and uh, what do we have a horn? Yeah, horn works pretty good. And here is that Argentinian gold medallion staring at you. Uh, over here you have a digital clock with the, um, uh, it's telling, look at this giant thing to tell you it's got a chronometer, uh, which is of course, uh, advertising agency speak for clock and if you go in the glove box that's how you adjust it uh, here you have an AM AM radio which obviously a base radio actually this is uh, AM FM stereo Let's see what we got missing you yeah, you know you're old when the oldie stations is playing shit that you remember from like yesterday uh, here's your uh, climate control you got a nice big uh, cigarette lighter which again it doesn't look like it was used which is criminal in a Cordoba holy shit okay well you don't obviously want to pull the ashtray out too far where that's where it ends up so um <laughs> Don't give that one a tug. But you've got his and hers ashtrays, plenty of uh, spots to put your cigarettes. Here's that ridiculous defrost button I was talking about. I mean, so here's the hieroglyphic. You've got up, I mean, it looks like a, something the side would run like a dump bed on a pickup truck. And instead, it's just the defrost, which is just insane to me. Uh, let's get a little bit of AC going. God, that is actually nice. Look over at the glove box. Here's how you set the clock with this thing here. And uh, here is a book set. And you do have pretty good room in the uh, in the glove box for weapon storage. You get a revolver or a nine millimeter up here where this book set is. Uh, down here, you could even get like a longer, maybe like a target shooting 22 or something. Uh, that's a nice big swoopy uh, area down there for God knows what. Um, I presume if it had a trunk release, that would be here, but this one wasn't optioned as such. And uh, here is the book set where you've got that's the guy who apparently originally bought it. You see he was in Webster, Pennsylvania. It's not rusty underneath it. It has 42,000 miles, so he was probably 110 years old and never drove it. Um, he kept this. What is this, the jacking instructions? Oh, why am I revving him? Uh, wheel cover removal instructions. That looks like a serious pain in the ass. Anyway, there they are, and a variety of other little bits and pieces that go with it. So, nice little book set with the car and uh, happy to have it. So, all right, well look, let's just go for a spin. Uh, Dalton's windshield, and it might actually look better today uh, because I actually cleaned it myself. Well, oh, look up here, you got uh, a mirror and you've got um, map lights, nice. Uh, I had to clean it myself because it was so bad on my ride in that I knew it just wouldn't wash. I knew it. So while I was sitting here waiting for the sun to come up, I just said, the hell with it. I'm just gonna clean the damn thing. And I did, and uh, so don't think he did a good job for once. He really didn't. It was even shittier than usual, uh, which is saying something for him because it's almost always shit. Uh, I do like the uh, look out the front uh, window, the vista, if you will, with those uh, knife edge fenders on either side, the little hump in the middle, you got your Pentastar, you know, Mercedes looking hood ornament leading the way. And, uh, you know, everything's nice. Uh, pretty good assist for the power steering, nice little thin steering wheel, you know, perfect for the 80s. And let's see what this 85 horsepower can do. <laughs> yeah, not much. But I tell you what, before I read that it's 85 horsepower, I would have guessed higher. I mean, I know you're going to think I'm full of shit because the car is for sale and I really do want to sell it and move on. But it is not as anemic as 85 horsepower would suggest. 
I mean, the kick down is terrible, terrible. I mean, it's not putting you back in the seat by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but I mean, if you're just looking to cruise the boulevard, uh, I'll give you this, it's way, way better, way better than like a 1981 Mercedes 240D. Look at these people with these hats. I mean, do they have mirrors at home? Yeah, hi, hi. Apparently not. Anyway, um, you drive an 81 Mercedes 240D diesel and tell me this car isn't quicker. So you at least have that going for you. Uh, you also have the idea that if you look, if you're sitting at a traffic light next to a, you know, police car, uh, you can race him. You can wide open race that police car as much as you want. And uh, well, he'll never notice. He just won't notice. I didn't clean the outside of the windshield, and it turns out Dalton did a shitty job on that, so we're still not looking good. <laughs> oh, God. All right, so again, not the fastest car out there, but, you know, look, there it is. In 10 seconds or so, I'm pretty much up to highway speeds. I'm doing 65. Uh, it could be much, much worse. It's telling me to slow down even. My uh, Cordoba is too fast for the uh, for the nag uh, things that the uh, call your sheriff's putting out there. I hammer it, too fast to get a kick down. That one barrel carburetor sucking high test race fuel. <laughs> anyway, there it is. So, you know, it is still a personal, a personal luxury coupe. You've got these sort of over-assisted brakes, you've got this over-assisted steering, uh, you got this nice thin steering wheel. Um, they, you know, had Chrysler lost something in terms of luxury by this point? Yeah, I mean, unquestionably. I don't, that the window cranks, for God's sake. Uh, but it still feels nice. You've got all this wood in front of you, you got your little digital clock, you got radio, who do we have now? And, you know, we appreciate oh, yeah. nothing. I actually programmed this. So. Yeah, commercials everywhere. Uh, but anyway, it's not that bad. And it's really a fun car to drive. It really, really is. I enjoy moving this thing down the boulevard, I have to admit. I mean, look, it would be fun to buy this thing and put like a Hellcat motor in it. You know, obviously you have to tune up the suspension and shit. But uh, some kind of Hemi or Hellcat. Uh, would be a lot of fun to put under the hood of this and get rid of this 85 horsepower slant 6. But if you're just looking to have something that's kind of cool, a good cheap entry level collector car that nobody really knows exists anymore and uh, gets you questioned at cars and coffee or traffic lights, uh, you could do a lot worse. You really, really, you could be in that van for instance. So it, uh, it definitely isn't all bad. And uh, it's just fun to drive. So look, I'm not gonna keep rambling on. This is an 81 Chrysler Cordoba. Finally, you can stop nagging me about it. You two or three guys, and you know who I'm talking about. It's here, the video's up. And um, it's gonna be for sale at Auto House of Naples. And uh, obviously, God, they over-assisted brakes. Chrysler did that, man. You got an old Fifth Avenue, and for whatever reason, you hit the brakes, it like puts you through the windshield. So you got figured out what was going on. This car's a little bit like that. Um, so there it is. If you have an interest, give them a call, autohousenaples.com or uh, by phone, 239-263-8500. I think I'll be able to get a highway run in today, so uh, we'll do that. Otherwise, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Uh, we're going to keep plugging along, and I will see you with the next one. Take care.